Let me ask you something really important, something you may have never considered before. Should the news media name mass shooters? Should the media, should we at CNN show their faces? Now, my instinctive answer is yes. Journalists are taught to show the truth, the whole truth, no matter how awful or sinister it is. But the parents of Alex Teves and Jessica Phillips say no. Alex and Jesse were killed in Aurora, Colorado, inside that movie theater on July 20th, 2012. And this week, as 9,000 people were summoned for jury selection in the trial of the shooting suspect, family members launched a campaign, nonotoriety.com, to deprive mass killers of attention by urging the media not to show them on air or online. The truth is that before I sat down with the Tees and Phillips families, I was planning on saying the Aurora killer's name right here and showing his face right there on screen. But what they said to me was persuasive. I still think members of the press have to examine these shooters. They have to examine their histories, sometimes have to show their faces. But we also have to think about the impact that repetitive media images can have. And we have to consider these families' arguments. As Alex's dad, Tom, said to me, they are members of a club with the world's highest admission fee. No one wants to join. And once you're in, you can never get out. So listen to Tom and his wife, Karen, here, joined by Lonnie and Sandy Phillips, who are joining the campaign. See if they change your mind. Tom, I want to start with you and ask you about the first time that you saw the face of the man that killed your child and, and heard the name and, and what stood out to you in that moment. We had landed the night before in Hawaii to go on vacation. And at 4.30 in the morning, Hawaii time, Amanda was Alex's girlfriend, love of his life, so to speak, rang my phone and she said, Tom, there was a shooting. We we're at the theater. There was a shooting. And, and, and I tried to wake him up, but they pulled me away. I said, where's Alex? And she said, they, they made me leave him. They made me leave him. And then we spent trying to find, you know, calling hospitals at, you know, 445 in the morning in Hawaii time. So then we turned on the television. We could find out nothing other than seeing that thing's face and what that thing did. There wasn't anything about any victims. There was nothing. I couldn't even leave the television on because I was going to break it. And that's the first time I saw his face. And when you say thing, he's not you're doing that on purpose. Why? Well, I'm, because he's not a human. What human being would walk in and take a machine gun and start shooting people in a, in a theater? He shot a six-year-old girl, point blank. That's a human being. If that's a human being, that's a race I don't want to belong to. I ask about that day because that day led to this day. And, and Karen, you've led the charge on a website called, and a campaign called No Notoriety for gunmen like this man. Um, what spurred you to want to do this? Well, the quest for notoriety and infamy is a known motivating factor for people that want to commit uh, mass killings or copycats. All we're asking is after the initial identification of a, a mass killer, set up the initial, initial identification, and throughout the article or newscast, just refer to them as the shooter, the defendant. Hmm. Um, it's not that difficult. I also ask them to stand in my shoes, stand in the shoes of a parent who had a child brutally murdered by someone that their only motivation was to have their, their face splattered all over every ounce of media out there. And I have a feeling that whoever writes this article will do their best to limit that name. Lonnie and Sandy, you're wearing the same buttons as well, mm -hmm. uh, relaying the message. Um, I'm hearing Tom and Karen say they've been thinking about this ever since the day of the shooting, that the, the media should not be showing the names and showing the faces. When did you all start thinking about that? Immediately. The same um, time? Yeah, I, I remember the same day and we were lucky that we knew that Jesse was gone. We, we knew early on we didn't have to go through the search and the questioning, uh, where is because she, she, is was she in the hospital? put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital. Right. We knew because her face was the first plastered over the news. Of, she was the first victim, but other than that, it's the picture of the killer. I remember turning on CNN and turning the, the television on that morning, and that's the first image that I saw, and I actually threw up and had dry heaves every time his picture came on. 
and it still does that to me. So we're already victims and we get re-victimized over and over and over again by seeing that picture, hearing his name, uh, having to deal with all the things that we have to deal with just to survive getting out of bed. Two and a half years later, trial starting, it's going to start all over again. Yeah. And it's not going to be like it's been two and a half years. It's going to be like it was yesterday. Ilana, you wrote an, an essay for Politico, um, The Killer I Refuse to Name. Uh, and you said in it, and, and I wanted to quote part of it, you said the judge's decision in, in this trial means that the killer's need for a worldwide stage outweighs the rights of the victims. That's because he's decided to allow one camera inside the trial. Are you at peace with that decision? It's my feeling that the trial would be covered just as well without the camera. The camera is going to create a, a, an ele electronic record, a media that's going to be on YouTube. It'll be there forever to re be replayed over and over again. Um, not necessary. It's really not necessary to, for the uh, outcome of the trial to be any different. Uh, he was unable to provide any kind of proof that having cameras there would better serve justice. So why have them? So when you bring this up to journalists, what do they tell you? What they are their always, reasons? First off, they always go, well, we have to tell the story. Quite frankly, I think you're hiding behind it. The facts are the data is unsurmountable, that it is a material reason they do this. Do you buy into the slippery slope argument that if journalists make this choice, then there could be other choices down the road that are, that are You've harmful? You've already made it. Yeah. You don't name rape victims. You don't name children. You've already made it. Tell me the relevance of whether you put the thing's picture and its name on television or you just say the shooter and then you do the rest of what you were going to do other than you think it draws viewers and clicks and ratings and creates revenue. If we want this to stop, and I would assume CNN wants it to stop, you could make an argument that from a revenue generating perspective, it's a big boom for you guys. But that's a horrifying thing to say. That is a horrifying thing to say, but you I'm, could make that I'm argument. horrified every day. But I wonder what would happen if there was a blackout, if there was no photo, if there was no name. Because I do think some people learn from looking into the eyes of these madmen. I have looked into his eyes, and that killer was very detached when they were speaking of the lives that it took mm. um, and other aspects. The moment a photo of himself came onto that big screen, his eyes lit up, there was a small smile. I can see his eyes crinkle um, with, with delight, actually, and it, and it made me physically ill. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. They crave it. They like it. Right. You're giving it to them, and we're asking you to take it away. I guess as a journalist, you have to decide whether you want to be Walter Concrete or you want to be TMZ. I mean, that's basically that's the choice. Do you want to tell the truth and do what you have through the medieval times, your role in society? Mm. Because it's a very, very important role, and I have huge respect for you guys. But which do you want to be? You know, choose, you have to choose. You can't, you can't do it halfway. And, and you have to feed the beast. We get that. But how much do you have to feed that beast? And when does it cross the line from being factual to being sensationalism? And I think that's where we need to, to go with this whole conversation is really what, what do you have to do? I actually challenged Anderson on camera. This is Anderson Cooper of CNN in one of the parking lots Your covering guy. the story. Yeah. yeah, Anderson Cooper and said, you know, I'll give you a challenge. Don't, don't name them. Can you get through it the next 12 minutes without naming them? Stop naming them. Because this, this, this is, it's awful for us, okay? But the reality is it could be awful for anybody in this room because what you're doing is go making a call to action for all the people out there that need the motivation to move from thought to action. You believe that the media was not... Um giving saturation coverage to them, that they wouldn't go through with it. I believe they would go through with it. The next one wouldn't. We are asking for the media not to turn our children's deaths into a form of entertainment. Stick to the facts. Don't lend notoriety to, the, to these killers. This is not for your entertainment. These are our lives. These are our children's lives that once were. 
And that's also what we're asking. As soon as we started talking, I noticed that Lonnie gripped Sandy's hand and Karen reached for Tom's hand. For them, this is not a tragedy in the past. It is very much in the present and always will be.